Um, inshallah, we're going to start with our Qari sister, Tasneem Abdullahi. Uh, if she could please come to the stage, she's going to begin reciting, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الطالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال وأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah khairan for that beautiful recitation. Inshallah, we're going to start with the next session uh, titled How Wonderful the Affair of the Believer Is. And I'm just going to call up all of the speakers. First, our youth director and the moderator for this panel, Abdullah Hussain. Uh, the faculty member at Taysir, Dr. Michael Dan, the secretary of MCK, and also a faculty of Taysir, Ustad Nadim Siddiqui, and a clinical psychologist and faculty of Taysir, Dr. Salman Tour as well as our Munshid, Brother Amin Librami. Please all come to the stage and uh, please remember to unmute your mics, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <coughs> inshallah, we'll begin our uh, next session. Uh, this session's a panel discussion. Um, and so we're gonna have, inshallah, uh, presentations from, from all of our speakers. We'll have a short break for some nasheed, inshallah. Um, and salawat on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then we'll we'll end inshallah. So I want to first ask uh, Dr. Abdullah Dan <coughs> from Taysir Seminary, inshallah, to 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 start us off. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه من تبع بإحسانا إلى يوم الدين. Um, our theme for this panel is a hadith of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. عجبا لأمر المؤمن. How amazing is the affair of the believer? Or how wonderful is the affair of the believer? أمره كله خير. Uh, all of his Affair is good. How wonderful is the affair of the believer? Every single thing for them is good. And that's for no one other than a believer. That's for no one other than a believer. In Asabahu Sarra Shakar. If the person if some good thing happens to that person, they're grateful. Wa in Asabahu Dara Sabar. And if uh, some calamity or difficulty afflicts the person, then they exercise patience, right? Um, and that hadith is a, it's an amazing promise and a cure for so much of what ails us. But the Prophet ﷺ puts in it a condition that's very clear and maybe that we overlook, that that is only for the believer. Only for the believer, right? And, uh, we can think about believer in its most general sense, the most general sense of that word. Anybody who says, uh, I believe in Allah, I believe in one God, I only worship Allah, la ilaha illallah, and I believe in Sayyidina Muhammad as the final messenger of Allah. 
right? But Allah, in general, right, in the hadith and the Quran, a believer is somebody who has gained a certain status in the faith. I don't want to say gained a certain status, but progressed in the faith. Progressed in the faith. Uh, and they have certain qualities, right? So the Prophet ﷺ tells us that none of you truly believes until I'm more beloved to that person than uh, their wealth, I'm sorry, than their father and their children, their, their parents and their children, and all of humanity. Until I become the most beloved person to that person, they don't truly have faith, right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the believers are only those who believe in Allah and His Messenger and then do not waver, and then do not waver, and strive with their wealth and their possessions in the way of Allah. They strive with their wealth and their possessions in the way of Allah. So when you look at the conditions for who a believer is, they're not small conditions. In other words, if somebody is not expending their effort and their energy in the way of Allah, they may be a Muslim, but not a believer. Right? And most of us, we don't always have this hadith top of mind as we go through life. That every single thing that happens to me has the potential to be good for me. Every single thing that happens to me has the potential to be good for me. It's only a matter of how I respond to it. That's the only thing, right? And that patience or uh, gratitude, the extent to which that becomes our natural response to our experiences in life, to the extent to which those things become our natural and automatic response, has to do with our orientation to Iman, our orientation to faith in the unseen, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe, maybe I'll stop here and, and we, we move on inshallah, but Allah gives us uh, a variety of things to ponder on and reflect on that should make us have the quality mentioned in this hadith. They should give us that, that natural response of either patience or gratitude to anything and everything that we go through, inshallah. Uh, so we, we stop here and uh, Abdullah, I can give it back to you. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. You know, uh, what, what you'd mentioned, subhanAllah, reminds me, you know, you mentioned this, this beautiful point, subhanAllah, that even things that might seem at first like, like extremely difficult or an, a, a huge loss, for instance, that with the right iman, with the right perspective, you can see it as something that's beneficial. And then through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom, of course, that it can turn out to be something that ultimately was beneficial for each person. Um, <clears throat> SubhanAllah. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, I think this, the format of this is more of a you know, panel uh, discussion, conversation, inshallah. I wanted to ask, what do you say to people um, who who fear consequences or repercussions when it comes... We'll, we'll speak on the topic that's just here in front of all of us. What do you say to people who speak about consequences or repercussions at work, at school, when it comes to even saying something about Palestine? This is something that I've, you know, I'm, I'm a youth director, as you all know. And, you know, part of me, you know, I, I feel like it's an, an important part of my responsibility to be just extremely honest and you state the truth and you state the haq. And so I wanted to ask, and then I have a lot of people might, who, who are telling me, you know, you need to make sure that we don't face any consequences. Be careful about what you say because this might happen or that might happen or such and such might happen. So we have on one end, you know, when it's kind of a, a, an untethered understanding, we have this understanding that even when bad things happen, it's good for us. So what do you say when it comes to this idea of like avoiding any sort of difficulty or, or even toning things down so that you don't reap any repercussions or face any repercussions? What do you say to this kind of idea and understanding? And this is open to Dr. Dan or Ustad Nadim or Dr. Tour, whoever wants to take that, inshallah. It just was, was brought to mind in your, in your talk. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sallam. I think 
You know, I'm a chaplain at UT, and um, I'm on a thread with lots of chaplains all over the country, and there's like this sense in the chaplain community of conflict avoidance. When we talk about the theme of this conference today of the Sira, it's a lot of it has to do with emotional, mental health, and spiritual health. And chaplains deal with that on a daily basis all the time. But what's, what's interesting in the issue of Gaza, you see that everyone there in that group tightens up. There's, there's a fear of speaking out. Their natural disposition is to, you know, they're, they're the people of consolation and, and, and consoling people, but when it comes to issues of conflict or justice, that's not like the cup of tea that they, that they have. When we look at the verses that um, our sister recited, which is tied directly to this, you know, she recited those verses, uh, the, like, the hadith that we're looking at. What happens a couple of verses before this? What does Allah SWT say? You're the better reciter, so I'm gonna let you recite it. Well, tell me, what does he say? And, and before that, what is it? Remember me? Yeah, remember me. He is, and be thankful to me. Th so the gratitude, like the, what is the condition of the believer? How great is it? He's thankful in times of goodness. And Allah SWT says, be thankful to me. And the opposite is, and the shaitan says, wala, uh, uh, wala hum shakiri. Like the shukr and this concept of gratitude is right there. It's like a thematic major monster. And like Dr. Dan said, but it's only for those who, is, who it's, it's a difficult thing because it's both aspirational and required for the believer. On the one hand, it's required. You have to be grateful. But on the other hand, it's not something that comes without a lot of difficulty. Being on a constant state of alhamdulillah, look at the people of Gaza. Like, look at us and look at them. Look at their gratitude, look at our gratitude. Look what they have, look what we have. Look at the gratitude levels in matters of difficulty. And look at the patience levels. When you compare the patience of the Gaza and, and we look at ours, look at that. But what is these verses about? Like then it says what? You know, patience and prayer. The next verses is about the people who are patient and in prayer. Thankful and then patience. Hadith, thankfulness and patience. All of this hadith. What's that all, what do these verses come down? When did they come down? What is this relating to? Inna lillahi wa inna rajiun. What is it re relating to? From the Sira, it's a Sira conference, so we have to talk about the stories of the Prophet. What is that relating to? It's battle of Badr, the people are dead. I don't say that they're dead, it's, a, it's, it's about jihad. You, we want to, sometimes in our spiritual desires to practice Islam, we want to isolate the totality of the Sira and really compartmentalize it into like personal improvement. Like it's like a self help exercise. And we take the communal realities and the realities out of it. Who is patient in prayer other than people? Who is patient? Who prays? Who's grateful other than people? Gaza. We're in a Sira conference, right? And the term Sira, Sira Nabawiya, what is that? Your Arabic, my Arabic instructor. It's a pad, but is this always been called Sira? These stories of the Prophet they're always called Sira? Is that the name it was always, we as, Modern young students call it Sira Nabawiya. But the books of this, what are they called? Make sense? Nobody. Maghazi, the battles of the Prophet <laughs> You understand? Like the, so we should just rename the conference. Right now we're on a war footing. I, just to be honest, we're on a war footing. We, we cannot be... And so when you take patience of prayer and you say, oh, what does it have to do with jihad? Well, it's right there. It's about Badr. The Sira is about the battles. And how do you read the Sira except through Badr and Uhud and Khandak and Tabuk? How do, you, how do you appreciate any of those stories and you extract from it all of the meat and the substance from the whole thing? Brother Harithi mentioned the four two billion. There's no reason on a practical level that the seven million people of the Bani Israel could overcome two billion. It doesn't make any sense. Unless there's something wrong in the, the movement from Muslim to Mu'min to Mu'sin, or a disaggregation. The, the Bani Israel are not scared of jihad. <laughs> They're not scared of jihad. They embrace jihad as part and parcel of national identity and their community and their self-preservation and on and on. And so does the American system. Everyone salutes the Marines. 
Everyone salutes the Air Force. Everyone stands up for the start. And we are like getting nervous. I say jihad and everyone's like, oh my God, please don't talk about this movie. Please stop. We don't know who's listening. And this speaks to your issue of fear. We just got a letter from, um, who is that? The ADIA, what is that? The Jewish community who right, lobbies it. Anti-Defamation League. They just sent a letter to all the presidents of all the universities saying that we need to crack down on terrorism. If anyone speaks up against Israel, it's terrorism. If anyone speaks out against, we need to crack down, we need to remove it. The reason I'm the chaplain at University of Tennessee is because a few years ago, same thing, bombing of Gaza, we spoke out against Palestine, and the Tennessee legislature wanted to kick MSA completely, wanted to com kick off the MSA from the university for just speaking about the atrocities of Israel. And they said this is terrorism, just, just speaking out against it. So th is there a fear in the audience? Like, this is the question. If we're at a conference of the Sirah, and we're talking about the reality of the life of the Prophet we're talking about Khandaq, we're talking about Badr, we're talking about the embargo, we're talking about the boycott, we're talking about the suffering. And then in that context, we look at patience and prayer. Patience and thankfulness and gratitude and shukr. Not in the context of just day-to-day -day reality. Not in the context of suburban Islam, suburban lifestyles. But in the context of what's real, what's really happening. And what will happen if. And I think that tightness, we can't disaggregate it. I think that it would be a disservice to the people of Gaza. It would be a disservice to the legacy of the Prophet Wasallam and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam if we disaggregate these things. Jazakallah khair. Um, so I think you brought up a really good point. You said somewhere along the route of Islam to Iman to Ihsan, we've gotten lost. Now I'm going to ask a, a specific question here. Where, how do we, on a day-to-day -day basic ba basis, as American Muslims in Knoxville, Tennessee, how do we get to that level? Because ultimately that's what the purpose of this talk is, of this session is. Like how do we actually achieve that level? of reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, of fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, of achieving that heightened level of iman and ihsan. So that's, uh, that's a question I want to pose to our speakers, inshallah. How do we get there? Right? We know this, you know, we all could quote a hadith and, and verses of ihsan, iman, islam, all sorts of things. But how do we embody that? How do we get to that point as individuals and as a community? I think that's what, what, is, what is extremely important to get to the bottom of. So I ask, inshallah, Dr. Tool, uh, if you want to to touch on that. And then this is also open to other panelists, inshallah, to, to discuss. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So we're talking now about practical steps, and I think everyone's given some excellent points. And, you know, whether we're talking about Gaza or anything that we fear, right, because we're talking about anxiety and fear and how are people going to relate to me or what are they going to do? Am I going to be canceled? And, you know, these kind of things, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. But when we think back to this Hadith, right, and the idea of if we practice, right, when something happens to us, whether it's good, perceived as good or perceived as bad, how do we take this moment and kind of practice what I think of, right, cognitive flexibility? Right? This idea of, okay, this perceived bad thing has happened, our mind goes to what? Why did this happen to me? Why is my life unfair? Why you know, am I facing these things when I'm trying to be a good Muslim or a good person or those kind of things? Versus how do we take a deep breath right? and kind of say, just as an exercise, what is the good in this? Right? Is it because it's going to teach me patience? Right? Or is it... Maybe I'm focused on my own nafs. Maybe I'm focused on how I feel versus what's happening around me, right? And so even yesterday, I was having a conversation with a brother in the community who may or may not be here. And he was talking about a difficult situation. And the, the person that he was dealing with was quite difficult, realistically, not just to this person, but a number of people felt this way. And he had talked about how it was difficult and it was exhausting, but it was also a moment for me to learn about myself, like the way that I reacted, right? The way that I interacted with this person, the way that I coped with my own stress and my own feelings. And so 
I think that's an important thing to remember, and it reminds me of, as I was trying to prepare for this, and first and foremost, alhamdulillah, if I say anything that's beneficial, it's because of Allah, and if I say anything that is harmful, it's because of me. And so there's a hadith that talks about when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he was holding his son, Ibrahim, and he's passing away, right? And he talks about how, right, my eyes are full of what? Tears, my heart is full of grief and sorrow, but my mouth, right, the words, I only say what? What is pleasing to Allah, right? And so how do we practice this on a day-to-day -day basis? And it doesn't have to be, right, big things like conflicts or tragedy or those kind of things. It can have, even be if you're late to work or school or this or that, and to be able to say, right now I'm feeling this way or that way, but how do I take a step back and see the goodness in it? And we have a number of moments throughout the day, if we really think and reflect, where we can practice this. And the more that we practice this, the more we'll be ready when it comes time to speak out about these kind of things in a very measured way, right? So when we talk about how, how do we speak out, or if we want to say something, or if I want to retweet something from Twitter, but someone might see it, right? How do we speak or share in a way to where we feel our emotions in a balanced way so that we can express ourselves in a very poignant way. And so I really encourage everyone, even reflecting on the Hadith that was shared, right? If something good that happens, do I think to myself, humbla, I'm pretty good, right? Like that's, that's all me. Or do I say, humbla, it's for the sake of Allah, right? And if something perceived bad happens, right? Does my mind go to, why does the bad thing always happen to me, right? Why is my life unfair? Versus, wait a second, this is really difficult, but what is the goodness in this? Is there something good, right? So if I'm seeing people in my office and they say, oh, I was driving and this person honked at me and they gave me the finger or they did this or they did that, I might say, okay, think of one reason why they did that, right? And then they give me a reason. Okay, think of a second reason why they might've done that. And then I go all the way to 10 reasons. And by the 10th one, it's, sometimes nonsensical, it's like they must have been an alien and they're trying to act like a human and they don't know how to do it. And it sounds silly, but the idea behind it is how do I reflect, right? How do I create this flexibility in my mind, which alhamdulillah will serve you well and psychological research shows when we are able to reflect and have this flexibility, we have lower levels of stress, right? We have lower levels of depression, we have lower levels of anxiety, of trauma and those kind of things. And humble Brother Harithi has shared many instances in the last few days about the resilience of the people of Gaza, right? And when you watch these horrific videos, what do you hear from the people? I continuously hear, Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, when these terrible things are happening, right? And so how do we practice these kind of things to where you would have every right to be sad or angry or all these negative emotions, but in that moment, can I hold on right, to my deen, and think about, okay, humbla, there's something good here. Even if my heart doesn't truly believe it, how do I practice saying that? JazakAllah um, khair. Yeah, so these are some practical steps. And I want to point out, you know, what, what Sister Maha had mentioned earlier today, that this is, uh, this is one of the two community-wide larger conferences that we do here in Knoxville. And I think it's important to recognize that. And you know, to the point that Sad Nadim made, this, this functioning as believers and this growth towards belief, um, it's not an, just an individualistic thing. And I think you know, some things how that I learned uh, you know, growing up was I, that, is that Islam is, is not just an individualistic thing. Oftentimes it's taught to us as something like this, where it's just, you know, you, it's a, you know, I think he described it as a self-help book. It's a personal improvement thing. And to some degree, of course, it is. But also a huge part that can't be subtracted from the entire equation is the communal aspect of it. So I want to ask, um, inshallah, uh, our, our speakers here, how do we on a communal level achieve this level of iman and ihsan that can actually solve this problem <laughs> you know like we're faced right now we have a perfect example of you know if we just look at the numbers there's there's seven million people that are in complete control over a group that's a member of a group that's two billion 
So how do we, you know, achieve some sort of success as a community to combat this or to, to have success in this regard? Um, Um, we, we keep hearing this juxtaposition of numbers, right? Two billion and seven million. Um, and the, the Prophet ﷺ addressed this in a very direct way in a hadith where he talked about the future of the ummah. And he said that there will come a time, he, he described the colonial period essentially, right? As far as we can, you know, we don't, we don't say exactly, but Allah knows best, but that's what it appears. Right, that there will come a time when the nations call each other to take pieces of you, like people call one another to eat from a plate. Right, they call one another to a meal, and they each eat their portion of the plate. And that's essentially what we saw beginning around uh, 1800 into the middle of the 20th century. And now we see that, you know, that th this incident in, in Gaza shows that that has not ended. It hasn't ended, right? If it had ended, Egypt would send water. If it had ended, <laughs> uh, it, it, right, so, um, the, 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 that juxtaposition, the Prophet ﷺ gave a reason said, You're insignificant. You're like the foam on a torrent of water, right? You're, you're, and that he said, And weakness is, well, is put in your hearts. And they said, What do you mean by that weakness? And he said, Loving this world and hating death. Loving this world and hating death. And so our orientation to the hereafter is the first thing that we start with. Am I someone who is oriented to the hereafter? The hereafter is not a distant theory. The life to come is not something that's coming somewhere down the line and occasionally I think about it and maybe it's there and, and you know, I, I hope I enter Jannah. Jannah has many, many levels. Jannah has a hundred levels. Prophet ﷺ said, Jannah has 100 levels that are only for Mujahideen. Jannah has 100 levels. It has more than 100 levels, but it has 100. And he said the distance between each one of those levels is like the distance between heaven and earth. And the only people who occupy those levels are the people of Jihad. The only people who occupy those 100 levels of Jannah are the people of jihad. And so when it comes to um, something like speaking out or sacrificing, uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ said the greatest jihad is a word of truth spoken to an unjust tyrant. The greatest jihad is a word of truth spoken to an unjust tyrant. And one of the things we see it again and again and again in the Quran is that faith removes fear. Faith gives courage and removes fear. When Pharaoh threatens the magicians, they just believe, just in that moment. They just, Iman entered their hearts. Pharaoh threatens them, and the magicians say, La dair. Inna ila rabbina lamun He says, I'm going to cut off your hands and your feet from opposite sides, and I'm going to crucify you. And they say, no harm. We're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we never prefer you over the clarity that has come to us. So faith, uh, Do people think that they'll be left alone to say that we believe, we have faith, we have Iman, and they will not be tested? We certainly have tried those before them. Allah will know those who are true in their claim and he will know those who are false. And as far as 
building faith, maybe we, we say just a little bit and then we leave that to, to the other panelists. Um, the Prophet ﷺ gave us very clear steps. We start from the fara'id, and we go to the nawafil. Allah, Allah tells us, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. O oh, you who believe, have taqwa of Allah, beware of Allah, and be with people of sincerity. Be with people of sincerity. When you see faith embodied and modeled, that's the most powerful thing. When you see it lived in a, in, in a person, in, in real life situations, and you see how they respond to difficulties, and you see their courage, and you see their sacrifice, then you have the potential to absorb that from them. You have the potential to absorb it. Um, and, and so the, you know, that, and, and it's a process. It's not, you know, Allah gives what he wills to whom he wills, how he wills, and there are people who undergo very rapid transformation. But the general rule is that building that faith is a process and it's a commitment and it's a daily commitment and a weekly commitment and a monthly commitment. And so, you know, when, when we have uh, gatherings for that purpose, for the purpose of, of, of building our faith, we need to be there, right? Um, so in, inshallah, we, we give it to the other. Inshallah, sometimes it's like a curiosity. We're talking about sabr and thankfulness and why on, you know, but the, it's not under, unconnected. You know, if you want to have, like imagine a situation of sabr and we misunderstand it badly. Patience can be misunderstood badly in a way that's debilitating, problematic. Imagine you're, fa like out, you're, in, you're walking in the street and a bunch of bullies come, 10, 15 bullies, and they grab your friend or your brother or the one you love and they start beating on that person. And you just watch, and you're like, we need to be patient. And we have to be wise in the sense that there's a Meccan period and a Medinan period. There's a period of the boycott, there's a period of toleration, there's a period of absorption, but you also have to realize that even in Sabr, the Prophet ﷺ is marching to Tabuk, he's marching to Fatih Mecca, like he's, he's marching to wherever he's going to, he's marching to Uhud, he's marching to Badr. So, the idea is the wisdom, the hikmah of knowing what moment you're in, but the, but the willingness in the heart is so important. It's in, the, in matters of going from Muslim, is what's going on in between the ears, in between the heart, chest. What's happening inside of there, more so even than what's happening on the surface. What are you thinking? What's going on in your thoughts? What do you want to do? What do you think? What are you scared of? in matters of patience, in matters of gratitude. And what does that look like? Gratitude sometimes is not just a feeling, but a willingness to obey the commands of Allah. Gratitude is the willingness to obey what Allah has commanded, to accept it, to do what, he, to do what He's telling us to do, and to stay away from what He's telling us not to do. That's gratitude. Ingratitude is to be negligent of those things, to be negligent. So as uh, Dr. Dan said, you know, the basics first. The basics first, and then you ratchet up and keep going and keep going and keep going. But at least intellectually and spiritually, to accept what needs, accept the trajectory or accept the totality of the command or the totality of the Quran or the totality of the seerah and not cherry pick it and, and, compound, and to contain it into meanings that are smaller and less vast than they really are. The flip side of that, there's an inverse to that. And as a, as a chaplain who's dealing with students who are in different places of their, their path, there's a distinction between someone who is in a spiritual state to hear that. We're all at a Sira conference, and so saying it here, Alhamdulillah, you should be able to digest it easier than if I'm saying it to a bunch of students who've never you know, learned the basics. That to be able to digest that. And, and the other thing is, in this case of the sub, having, you know, just because we should be patient and we should be grateful doesn't mean that's where we're at. And I think one of the challenges in this conference in general and the topics that we've chosen is it's, it's not helpful to young people 
to be told to be stoic, because this is all stoicism, and, and it's a way, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is always training us to be a certain way, despite what our natural tendencies are. Our tendencies are to be muhabbat al-dunya, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sending us to the akhirah. He's, re, he's uh, reorganizing our priorities. And the more one spends time with the seerah, with the Qur'an, with the hadith, with people, with good companionship, the more that becomes a natural, to be stoic, or to be grateful in difficult, in, to be grateful in the face of difficulty. To love what Allah had ordained for you, to love what Allah had, had put in your path. He chose for you something and to love it, to be, alhamdulillah. It's difficult sometimes. And to, and to be patient in a moment where you want something other than the qadr. You want something other than, it's not something that's natural. So sometimes, it's not a healthy message to tell young people who have not gone through all of those progressions of training, all those progressions of, of the masjid, all those progressions of saluk, all those progressions of good companionship, and start them off where, we, where one of us may be at. And just say, be patient, be grateful. Why are you ungrateful? Why are you impatient? The Prophet also said, you're, ungra- you're an impatient people. He said that, but he's speaking to a very tight audience. And then he speaks differently to people who are weak. The Prophet ﷺ, when someone is new to Islam, he's not giving them the same nasiha to the one who's with him all the time. And we have to just be really careful about that because one of the dangers of even, my, even the things I've just said is you impose that on someone who's a beginner, someone who's young, someone who hasn't seen what you've seen, and you'll break their hearts or make them dislike the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because you're forcing them too quickly through something that took you 20, 30 years to figure out, or took you years of study, or took you great companionship to arrive at, and now we say to them, why aren't you patient? Why aren't you grateful? Why can't you be stoic? Mental health issues are just a weakness of Iman. You know, that might be philosophically a way to connect those dots, but to a person who's not there yet, hearing those things can break the heart and can cause them to go the other way. So, even in these matters of giving serious nasiha, that jihad is the path. And we're not, when I say jihad, just for clarification, this is a defense. It's a situation, when we're in the prison system, Brother Duval's here, inshallah, and people come to Sunni Islam for protection. There was a brother who called, Brother Sajil called, and he said there was a person who was being attacked because of such and such and such and such, and he wants to accept Islam to get protection. Protection from the Muslims. It's, it's a reality. So being in the club, of Islam, because whenever someone hurts, the whole body hurts. It's like, then when our brothers are hurting, then, then, but it's doing them no good. In the sense that it's doing them good for the Akhirah, they're going there, but no ships are trying to penetrate, no one's trying to penetrate the, the embargo, no one's trying to penetrate to bring them relief. There's no cavalry coming. And how easy it would probably be if we all just decided to, to just start, you know, we're marching to DC, inshallah, on November 4th, and everyone should go to that. But imagine if we just all started marching to Jerusalem. <laughs> Who would stop two billion people marching? No one would stop it. What are they going to do? But we just, we don't have the himma. Allah ta'ala alam. La ilaha Allah. Ali wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. As much as I would love for this panel to continue, um, we, we don't have time. Inshallah, we'll... We'll hear more from our speakers, inshallah, and we'll hear more about this theme. Um, and we'll hear more on this and hear more advice from them all, um, you know, as we continue through the day. I encourage, like I said in the beginning, inshallah, I encourage us all, as we're listening to these teachers, to truly come with the intention that we're going to embody this, inshallah, this knowledge that we're learning, embody these lessons that we're taking home, inshallah, and to act upon them. Um, so, jazakumullah khairan, and inshallah, we will end with our dear brother Sidi Amin uh, from Noor Band who will sing a nasheed for us, inshallah. Jazakallahu al khair. And then after his nasheed, we'll, we'll, or we'll close with some dua, inshallah. Adimi salat ala al habibi Muhammadin Adimi salat ala al habibi Muhammadin 
فصلاته مسك وطيب أعمالنا ما بين القبول وردها إلا الصلاة إلا الصلاة إلا الصلاة على الحبيب محمد السلام عليك يا رسول الله الصلاة والسلام عليك الله عظم قدر شاي محمد وأنا له فوزا لديه عظيما في محكم التنزيل قال لخلقه صلوا عليه صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على المصطفى اللهم صل على المصطفى حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام اللهم صل على المصطفى اللهم صل على المصطفى حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام وكم ليلة البت في كربات وكم ليلة البت في كربات يكاد الرضيع لها أن يشيب فما أصبح الصبح حتى أتى فما أصبح الصبح حتى أتى من الله ناصر وفاتح قريب من الله ناصر وفاتح قريب اللهم على المصطفى اللهم صل حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام حبيبنا محمد عليه السلام الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الحليم الكريم سبحان الله رب العرش العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد النبي وعلى أزواجه أمهات المؤمنين وذريته وأهل بيته كما صليت على آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, we are grateful to you for bringing us together on this day. Ya Allah, keep us united for your sake. Ya Allah, keep us united upon the Qur'an and upon the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, make each of us a means towards the success and the victory of all Muslims around the world. Ya Allah, make us a means of, of the freedom of the people in Gaza. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, give us true, absolute reliance upon you and upon none other than you. Ya Allah, grant us all true uh, belief in your protection and that you are our only protector. And ya Allah, protect us from any evils from within ourselves 
or from outside of ourselves. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. Ya Allah, give us uh, faith that is strong, that does not waver in the face of any difficulty or any hardship or any ease. Ya Allah, give us faith that is strong, that is rooted in deep remembrance of you and, and love for the, you and love for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Allah, make us a community that is united in this way. And Ya Allah, allow us to see the day in which Bayt al maqdis is freed and liberated, in which all the Muslim lands are freed and liberated, in which the Muslim Ummah around the world is united for your sake, fearing nothing but you, fearing the approval or disapproval of nobody but you, and seeking protection only from you, knowing that you are the greatest protector. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, give us the best in this life and in the next life. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma asifoon, wa salamun ala al mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullahu khairan. Inshallah, we're, we're going to have a short break. Oh, sorry, no short breaks. So we'll go straight into our next. Uh, so we thank our speakers, Jazakumullahu khairan, um, Inshallah. And I think Sister Dalia, maybe, will be coming and joining us up here. Jazakumullahu khairan. Please stay, stay uh, present. <laughs> Allahu Akbar.